for us. Amen. You, that's how much love you have for us, Father. We, we tend to forget that we're your child. We are your children. And you love us that much. And the least we could do, Father, is, is worship you and give you praise, Lord, as we, we just did today, Father. And continue with our witness, Lord, as we go on this world, Father, that's broken and falling apart, God. It's just a stand. A stand for you as your children, Father. Because you love us so much that you died for us, Father. You've given us so much. We just have to remember we're your children. We can remember that throughout our days when we're we're saddened, upset. Maybe our boss yells at us or our children are upset with us. It it comes down to we're still your children, God. And you love us and you're going to guide us. You're going to help us through it, Father. But fear not for what we're just doing. And so, Lord, we just lift up this day to you. The message Pastor Ruben was going to give to us from your holy book, Father. I pray that it touches someone in this room, right? I don't know if you ever had that moment where, oh, he's talking to me. That pastor's talking to me. He's directing his message to me. It's not Pastor doing that, it's God. God is trying to reach you through Pastor. He's trying to reach you to get to help you understand it. I, I find that sometimes happen to me, I mean, when I'm here and I'm like, wow, that's just you, Lord, trying to talk to me. I think because you're, you're my father, you're my Abba, Lord. And if that's what you want me, is to, to listen, to pay attention, to hear that, that love that you have for us. So please, Father, if that happens to you today, then I pray that you surrender. You allow God to change you within. It's not Pastor doing it. It's not myself, Jess, or anybody up in here. It's, it's Jesus, God, doing it in your heart. Allow that change. Be ever transformed and know what it is to have this joy that you will never understand unless you let go. I hope you get that joy today. In the name we pray. Thank you. Let's all view one another.
Good morning. Welcome Good morning. to Calvary Chapel Inland. Glad to have you all here. All of those of you that are out in the courtyard, God bless you. Thank you for joining us today. If you need a bulletin, raise your hand and the ushers will get you one. We have a few announcements this morning. There's a lot going on. Praise God. So while they're passing out the bulletins, I will talk about the things that aren't in the bulletins. So we're having our fourth annual fall Christmas boutique. Boutique, right? Christina? Saturday, November 9th, 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. So if you'd like to sell your crafts and things that you do, and I know you're all artistic, then you are able to come and join that boutique. You can see uh, Patty Weeks or Christina who just answered my question, and the cost for a table is $15. And the neat part is it's one day after my birthday. Wow. Are you guys doing this for, for a reason? No. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. See how self-centered I am? I'm so self-centered. Okay, let's see what else we got here. Um, the ladies getaway. So I didn't get a chance to put it in the bulletin, but... They're having a getaway October 4th at 8.30 a.m. with the Continental Breakfast and ends on Saturday, October 5th at 4.30 p.m. Uh, during our free time, we will have swimming, assortment of games, and lots of getting to know one another. So this will be taking place at uh, my home, I believe. She doesn't have it on here. Yes, it is your home. It is at my home, so I won't be there, but Virginia will be there, and it's always a blast for the ladies to uh, get together like that. They always seem to have more fun than guys. Guys like to just get together and then go fishing, and then not talk the rest of the time. <laughs> Except for the big fish they caught, you know, and that's about it, so now we have a good time too. And the cost is $70, which is due upon sign-up, so there will be a sign-up sheet in the sign-up table outside in the courtyard. And then I wanted to let you know, and, and I don't announce these too often, but we have a family here in the church, and they're very talented. They're, they're actors and actresses. They do uh, plays at the uh, Life House Theater, which I believe is in Redlands, if I remember correctly. Yeah, Redlands off of Church Street. We used to live in Redlands, and we would uh, pass by this, this, this lighthouse, and they have uh, theatrical shows there. So it looks like September... 14 through October 13, uh, they're all involved in the Cinderella 
So if you ever want to go out, take your wife out on a date or your family or someone, you know, pick up one of these flyers and maybe uh, join them and enjoy them. Uh, I won't tell you who the family is. I think you'll, you'll, you already know. Then there's another one coming up called Job, the Modern Man. I think it's Job. The Job. Modern Man. <laughs> I hope it's Job. It could be Job, the modern, a modern man, but I think it's Job. Because it's very uh, biblical based and, and they take the story. So, And this is October 26th through the 24th. So these flyers are out there in the FOIA area and you want to just have a neat time, go out to dinner and then go to a plate, please uh, pick them up. Also, um, we have a lot of boxes that we get because of the, the food ministry that we have. So off in this corner, we get a lot of boxes. So if you're one that likes to collect boxes and then go turn them in to get some cash, uh, you're free to take all of them if you'd like because they don't all fit into our trash cans. We cut them up into small pieces, but it's just too much. So if you'd like to come by on a Monday morning or, or so, or even Friday morning, usually after the day we get all the food, you're more than welcome to take all those boxes. Or if you know somebody that does that, they're welcome to come and, and take those boxes. Uh, next Friday, the 5th through the 7th, is Youth Night. So Saturday, I'm sorry, Friday, the 5th is Youth Night, 6.30 here at the church. So invite all the youth, invite your friends to come on out. And then Sunday is the youth day where they serve us. They're our servants. <laughs> and they're taking care of us, their adults, peers, and so forth. So it's a neat time to watch them all serving and, and getting an idea of what it is like to be in ministry. Hmm? Oh yeah, car wash. I didn't put that on there. And there will be a car wash afterwards. So they will also wash your car for a donation though. And this will raise money for the events that are coming up. They have a, a huge youth uh, retreat coming up, I believe, at the end of January usually. And it's up at Green Valley Lake. And it's, it, it costs a little bit, but they're probably, what, at least 400 kids there, I think, if not more. And they all go up there and really have a neat time. And a lot of times they come back changed. I think Jesse, our worship leader, uh, had gone up there. And the Lord just touched his heart and see the anointing on his life and so many others that God has touched, so. so this will help offset the cost or hopefully pay for the whole thing and none of them have to pay for anything, which is, which is nice, so. All right, let's get to the bulletin now. So um, discipleship meeting is coming up this uh, Tuesday, September 3rd. Everyone is invited to 6.30 p.m. If you have a question, you've always wanted to ask the pastor or leadership, then this is the night to do it. Uh, so I answer questions about the church, about the Bible. It's just a time of discipling uh, as the Lord discipled the disciples. So uh, you're more than welcome to join us. And that's all ages, by the way. This coming Wednesday, uh, I, I, we have a special guest speaker, and I would love for all of you to come out. Uh, this guy uh, has been instrumental in saving uh, South Sudan in so many different ways. He is in charge of the far-reaching ministries, and he will be coming out this coming Wednesday and talk about that ministry, the ministry that I'm involved in and will be going uh, this coming October. Uh, I will not be live streaming this because uh, he'll be sharing information that I don't want to get out on the Facebook uh, and about my trip uh, at all. So we need you to come out and I'd love for you to come out. You know, I, I, I feel bad because we're a small church and, and someone at his statue and I know that he wouldn't ever uh, say this. But he, he is a man of God, and he is on fire, uh, and the Lord has used him in so many ways. And I feel bad because it's like, why would you come to a small group? Because I'll be there. I'll be there. I'll be there. I don't care how big it is. So I want to get as many of us out Amen. here to hear the stories, and he has some amazing stories. So big, tall guy, Marine, and, and I can't say it this morning, but I'd love to say more, but we're on on Facebook, so uh, just come on out this coming Wednesday, the 4th at 7 p.m., and invite someone to come out. If you want more information about it, we do have some uh, little articles out in the front that you can look, take some pictures of, and read. We don't have a whole lot of them to find out more about him, or look up far-reaching ministries in St. Marietta. <laughs> Men's retreat, guys, the money is due. We still have room for one day or so. If you'd like to come out on Saturday and join us, you're more than welcome. The cost is $50.00. For the one day, uh, the next installment has been due. So if you haven't uh, done that, please do that. And then we're having um, on September 9th, 
September 9th, which is, I believe, a Tuesday. Uh, we're having a meeting for those that would like to get involved in our Harvest Carnival <coughs> outreach. That's not coming until October, but we want to get a jump on it and begin to prepare that. So that'll be the 9th of September. We'll meet here at the church to discuss that event and what we'd like to do. All right, if I can have the ushers come forward. Oh, one more thing. Virginia has asked me to announce that since it is Labor Day tomorrow, and so many of you help us here in the church, we want to bless you by opening up our house tomorrow at 1 p.m. If you'd like to come out and go swimming and have a barbecue and, and just enjoy the day, then we'd love to have you all out. Um, if you don't know where we live, too bad. <laughs> no, <I'm just> kidding. <laughs> We moved? No. <laughs> uh, we're still in the same location. Uh, somebody will get you directions, or I will or Randy get you the address, and you can just Google it. Actually, if you just uh, go to MapQuest, you know, and go Casa Solis, you'll find it. Everybody will find it. Uh, all our information is out there. And if they want to find us, they'll find us like that. But we're ready. We got our Glocks, and we're ready to go. <laughs> But we'll have a good time. Just fellowship and say thank you for all the work that you guys all do here. Bring your drinks, your towels, you know, all those fundamental things uh, if you'd like to come out and join us. All right, let's pray. Gracious Father, we thank you, Lord, for your grace and for your mercies, Lord. Oh, it is amazing grace, Lord, how sweet that sounds, yes, uh, that you would save a wretch like me, Lord. I think Paul would say the same thing when he said, I am the chief of sinners. And Lord, I think that we all agree that we never measure up, Father. We always seem to miss the mark. There's a path that we're on, and sometimes we, we, we get off the path, Lord. And thank you, Lord, that you're so gentle and so kind to bring us back to that path, Father, without any condemnation, Lord God, but with love and gentleness and joy to see your children return uh, to the path that you have set for us, Father. Lord, may you bless the offerings and the tithes, Father. May you use it for your glory. Support your work here, Father, the work that you have begun, the work that you are maintaining, and the work that you will continue to do even far after I am gone, Lord. Bless, oh Lord God, the message, Lord, through the Holy Spirit, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right, let's open up our Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 8. <coughs> we'll be looking at verses 7 through 13. If you don't have a Bible, we have Bibles in the foyer area. You can raise your hand and they'll get you one. It's important that you <coughs> follow along with us. In fact, uh, you probably will not find, I'm sure there's some out there, but you probably will not find a church like our church when it comes to teaching. In the, in the sense, not that I'm good, I'm not saying that. Because I don't think that I, I'm that good. But in the sense that when I teach, I use the original language, the Greek, and I get into the Greek, and I, I pretty much uh, give you my amplified version of each verse within the Greek so that we understand the tenses of how Paul is saying it, and we grasp just the scriptures. Um, I don't expound too much more than that. Once in a while, the Lord just gives me a story in my head, or there's a note that I probably will use. But, and this has been recently, by the way. This has been recently since I have been studying the Greek language and getting that tool and using it. And we've been going through the whole book of Corinthians that way. So you can go back to Facebook and you can find the, the past teachings and you'll see what I'm talking about. But we'll get it today too. I am going to give you uh, the Greek language. And I, you might say, but we're not in a college atmosphere that you're a professor. I know that, but I'm a teacher. And God has called me to teach. And I think that you're intelligent enough to hear what the Word of God is saying Amen. and grasp it. Now, I believe that because it is the Holy Spirit that teaches us, mm -hmm. not me. And if you grab it and all of a sudden you go, wow, I've never seen that, that's not me. That is the Holy Spirit teaching you. And the Holy Spirit is here right now and He wants to teach you and help you understand God's Word so that we can live a productive life on this earth while we're preaching the Gospel to those around us until the Lord takes us home. He wants us to have a blessed life. Not that we have a perfect life, nor a life that is at peace all the time, but when we 
go through struggles. God is right there along with us to get us through those struggles, struggles if we have faith. So this morning's theme is biblical Christian liberty. Now I say biblical Christian liberty because there is a Christian liberty that I believe is incorrect. Uh, there are liberties that Christians take that they shouldn't be taking and they're stumbling their brothers. Now, God is about loving one another. He said that very clear in Matthew 22. He summed up all the Old Testament laws and he summed it up in two laws. And if you just remember these two laws and you apply these two laws to your, law, to your life, you'll do well. Jesus says you fulfilled the whole law if you just do these two. And that is love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. That's the first law that Jesus gave. So it's about a relationship. Loving God personally, one-on-one, -on -one, you and Him. Having this deep, intimate relationship. That is the first step of discipleship. Is having a relationship with God. If that means going away, and I just, as I looked over, the Lord just brought to mind the habit of forest. That he would go outside in the backyard and he would just talk to God all night long, sing to God. That's having a relationship with Jesus Christ. Taking time out of your busy schedule and making time for the Lord where it's just you and him. You and him. So that first commandment is fulfilled by you doing that. Just loving God with everything you have. And the second is what? Love your neighbor as yourself. As yourself. As yourself. Now here's the Christian view. Love your neighbor as you learn to love yourself. Do you ever hear that? First love yourself and then you can love others. How many have heard that saying before, right? That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches love your neighbors as you already love yourself. Paul in Ephesians even said, no man ever hated his flesh. That's the scripture speaking. Nobody ever hates his flesh. Even somebody that, that has a attitude that they're no good and they pity themselves, that's actually self-love, right? Because they're focusing on self. And so the second one is love one another as you love yourself. So God is about love and then you fulfill the whole law. And so the Christian biblical liberty is not about you having the liberties. It is about you and your concern for how your liberties affect others. Amen. Mm -hmm. We affect others. And God's concerned about that. And as Christians, we should be concerned also. I'll give you an example of this. And I'm not patting myself on the back. But I remember that when I first got saved, we had a party at our house. And Virginia loves the apple cider um, champagne bottles. You know, the ones that are martinis, something like that, right? And so she'd buy a lot of those things and we'd have a uh, company over and so forth. And one day I, I walked around uh, the house corner and went to the trash can and they were just all sticking out of the can. And I'm looking at them like, oh no, I can't have that. They look like champagne bottles and alcohol and they're pouring out of the can and people are walking by and go, wow, they had a party, you know? And I'm thinking, no, no, that's not right, you know? So I told Virginia, don't buy that stuff anymore. Now, I think I went a little bit too far. I think I went a little bit too far. After a while, I realized that, hey, we have liberties to drink apple cider out of bottles, right? Just when we throw them away, make sure they're always in the can and covered, you know? So, so I've changed a little bit in that sense. But God gives you that spirit that, how do I affect others? Do I stumble them? And that's what this is about. So here are liberties, uh, whether they're liberties or good works, will not improve or worsen our relationship with God. And I think that's something that Paul is going to bring out here as we go through. Uh, when it comes to the term communion, yes, we can improve our communion with God, right? Because we're communion, we're having fellowship, and we can always improve upon that, just like any relationship that we have with anyone else. The more time we spend with them, the more communication we have, we can improve on that. But yet, our union with God can never be improved or worsened. Your union, who you are in Christ Jesus, what Christ has done for you, has been completed and done. And it can never be Worse, or it can never be better. It's all there for you because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ and what he's done. Romans 5, 8 says, But God showed and clearly proved his own love for us by the fact that while we were still sinners, Christ, that is the Messiah, the Anointed One, died for us. While we were sinners, he died for us. So how much more does he love us and has sacrificed for us now that we're his children? So much more. Unconditional. 
Ephesians said, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And it's not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Did you get that? See, your salvation is based upon the grace of God, the favor of God towards you through the work of Jesus Christ. And it is received by faith, you believing that work. And that's it, nothing else. And it's no, not nothing at all. Otherwise, you can boast. If you do something good, oh, see God, that's why you saved me. No, no, God didn't save you because of that. God saved you because of his son. And you're working now just because you appreciate the fact that he saved you. And so Paul here is being very clear that we cannot improve on our salvation and our union to God at all. You can't ever improve on that. Now, we all understand what I'm saying because there are times when you do something wrong and you're going, God, I just, I, I wish I wasn't like that. I wish, I, I get it, you might not like me right now. No, God loves you with the same love that he loved you before and the same love that he'll continue to love you. That will never diminish. It's guaranteed that that will never diminish. I know your feelings might feel that way because of what you've done or maybe stumbled and so forth or maybe didn't do, you missed the mark or whatever, but the truth is God's love never changes in quantity. It's always there for you. So you can be assured of that. Even in your deepest and darkest moments, God loves you. Even when you feel like he's abandoned you, he hasn't abandoned you because he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we need to understand that truth that Paul's going to bring out here. So in chapter 8, Paul said that those who eat the food sacrificed to idols are eating defiled food. There are those who understood that an idol was nothing, so they did not think that there was anything wrong with eating food sacrificed to idols. Now, we talked about that last week. However, Paul said that doing this does not bring you closer to God, nor does it make you better. He warns them that they should be careful about their liberties, because if someone who is weak sees them, they will know no better and sin. And see, that is the issue is that you weaken their faith in Christ Jesus by bringing in your liberty, and then they end up sinning against the Lord. He'll also explain to the Corinthians that it is much better for them to get rid of their old ways and turn completely to Christ Jesus. And Paul will even end it with saying, look, if meat offends somebody, then I won't eat meat at all. So his own conviction on this subject. So verses 8 through 13 talk about this stumbling block that is put before the weak by a stronger Christian brother. So three points this morning. Not everyone understands, and I'll explain that as we go through. Not everyone understands the things that you may understand. And that's Paul's point here. You might understand that the idol is nothing, but there are some that don't understand that. They might be newborn Christians, still babies in the Lord. They haven't read the scriptures. They're still growing. They might be older adults but haven't read the scriptures and they're not quite sure how idols that they used to worship play in their new relationship with Christ. Second point, you sin against Christ. This is a point that we, boy, we really need to grasp this because this is a point that, that, that reaches all uh, planes of our relationship with God and also with humanity is that when we sin against somebody, we sin against Christ. And I'll explain that as we get there. And then I will cause my brother to, I will not cause my brother to stumble. That's the Apostle Paul. So let's read the text here. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, and we will read 7, uh, 7 through 13. However, there is not in everyone that knowledge, for some, with consciousness, of the idol until now, eat it as a thing offered to I an idol. And their conscience being weak is defiled. But food does not commend us to God, for neither if we eat are we better, nor if we do not eat are we the worse. But beware, lest somehow this liberty of yours becomes a stumbling block to those who are weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, Will not the conscience of him who is weak be emboldened to eat those things offered to idols? And because of your knowledge, shall the weaker brother perish for whom Christ died? But when you thus sin against the brethren 
and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never again eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. So we've got the context there. First point, not everyone understands. Verse 7 in the New King James says, However, there is not in everyone that knowledge. For some with consciousness of the idol until now eat it as a thing offered to idols, and their conscience being weak is defiled. Philip's translation puts it this way. For some, that is Corinthian believers within that church, who until now have been used to idols, they had relationship with idols because it's a very idolatrous place. It's the culture. And so they were used to worshiping idols of various natures. And if they were used to those idols, eat the food as offered really sacrifice to a god. So in their mind, not understanding that these idols aren't gods, but in their mind they're thinking they are gods, and their delicate conscience is thereby injured because they don't understand. So Paul ends last week in verse 6. So we get the context. He says this in verse 6. For us there is one God the Father of whom are all things, and we for him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we live. So he made that point very clear that there's only one God, and there are no other gods. And Paul is drawing from Jesus' words himself when he said in John chapter 14, verse 6, he said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, and you cannot get to the Father in heaven the Father of all things in creation, except through me. Now that's an absolute. That's an absolute. I know in our culture today, and in being sensitive and tolerant, that we don't want to make absolutes. We don't want to make absolutes because absolutes are what stumble a lot of people when we make an absolute. And so those tell you that there are no absolutes in this world. And so we can't make absolutes if there are no absolutes. The only problem is that they don't listen to their own words. Because when they say, there are no absolutes, what is that? That's an absolute. (laughs) I'm telling you, there are no absolutes. Well, you just gave me one. So if you just gave me one, there must be absolutes. And here's an absolute. There's only one God. There's only one God. There's only one way. There's only one life. There's only one truth. And it's Jesus Christ. He makes that clear. And Paul then brings that out here to the Corinthian believers. And so when he says, however, in the Greek, he's saying, he's saying as a reaction to this truth of one God, and I'm giving you my Amplified, not all men have this knowledge. In other words, this deeper, more perfect, enlarged knowledge of this truth of one God. And the, so idols are nothing. If there's only one God then the gods that people have made up with their woods, their their clay, and their stone, which they have eyes and they have ears, but they can't hear, nor can they see, nor can they answer your prayers, by the way. Only God can answer prayers. So if they have have not this knowledge, but some being accustomed, now this is an interesting word, accustomed. Some being accustomed to the idols until now. What Paul is saying here is some Christian believers, because they're young and they don't have this knowledge, they have this intercourse, this intimacy, which they are having with idols until this point. So it's talking about their deep connection with these idols. They were connected deeply. Um, As much as we are to Christ and believe that Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, they were to these idols. They really believed it. They put an idol in their pocket. They carried it around. They put it out. They prayed to it. They'd have a personal relationship with this object that was just material. But in their minds, their faith was in that idol. Isn't that what our world does today? Mm-hmm. Right? Those without Christ. Uh, how many times have you seen a concert by, well, I, I haven't, but with like Madonna or one of these rock stars and, and they'll gather together before and they're going to pray. Who are they praying to? They're just putting their faith and positive energy into nothing. And they're hoping it turns out good. Well, it turns out good because of God's grace. That is Jesus Christ's grace. He's having grace on them, even though it's, they think that it's this cosmic energy that's in the world today. And I think most 
most people today, if you talk to the world enough, you'll see a lot of them are either atheists or they believe in a God. Somehow there's a God, Gnosticism, um, or the, the world just has energy. There's energy, and, and you can tap into the energy that's in the world. I have no idea what the energy looks like, but it's energy, and that's what they believe. If you tap into that energy and you're positive, then positive things will happen. I don't agree. I believe there's one God, and he's having grace on them. He's showing them that it's through his grace that, he's ha that they have any of this. And then hopefully they'll see later on as he puts them through things. So these people were a cousin. They were having this intimacy with these idols. And he goes on and says, and they ate continually as if it were sacrificed to an idol. They really believed that. And their conscience, that is the soul as distinguishing between what is moral, good, and bad, that conscience that we all have. Uh, you know, sometimes you go to do something, you go, oh, I shouldn't do that. But then you don't listen to your conscience. Uh, that's the conscience. Sometimes it's your wife that says you shouldn't do that. And you go, oh. she's acting as your conscience. But it pricks your conscience anyway. And you go, maybe she's right. Or maybe he's right. He's always right because he's the husband. He's the head of the home. Right? <laughs> okay, not always. We think we're always right. Okay, we get half of it right. <laughs> we want to be right. <laughs> we do the best we can. But that's the conscience. And we all have that. And so here, in their own conscience, which is being weak, is defiled continually because they have this thought that this idol is really real. And this is what pollutes them. And that's what the word defilement means. It pollutes, it contaminates their relationship with Christ. So not every Christian has this kind of knowledge. That there is only one real God. And believe me, I I'm sure that there's some of you here that don't believe this. That don't believe that there's only one God. And, and the reason you don't believe it is because how can, there how can this one God then let all these people go to hell? And, and that's the thought that people have. He's not fair then. If he lets everyone else believe in Jehovah witnesses or Mormonism or Hare Krishna or these other idols. You go to India and there's idols all over the place. I mean, literally, you can drive down the street and you'll see a whole shrine of idols there. And you'll see the, the one God that they believe in, all these other gods, and they'll have pillars and buildings. Some of, some of them are half built because people will come by and pour their money into building it within their little neighborhood. So it's not completed yet. They're working on it. Others will be immaculate because there's rich people that believe in this. How can a God let them all go to hell if he's the only way? It doesn't sound fair, but it is fair because God is just. The word just means that he is fair in every definition of the word. Every man will stand before him knowing who Jesus Christ Amen. is. Um, in India, there are billions of Christians who are out daily preaching the gospel message just as there are here millions preaching the gospel message, and yet men will not repent and turn to Jesus Christ. So God is fair. There is only one way. And that truth will be presented to every one of us as it's being presented to you right now. And the challenge is, do you believe it or not? And that's up to you whether you want to exercise that faith or not. The Corinthian Christian who felt free to eat at the pagan temple may have based their freedom on correct knowledge, you know, they felt free. Hey, an idol is just a piece of wood. And the meat that was offered to them was, you know, so what? I can eat that meat. It's filet mignon. So I'm going to enjoy it. And so this is what Paul is saying. You have that knowledge. You understand that it's nothing. And so you can eat it. In fact, when I was in India, I probably ate, well, I, I'm sure I didn't eat meat that was literally offered. But a lot of the meat there and food has been offered to idols and is probably ready available to be eaten. But for some, they have this conscience of an idol, that it's real. Uh, they have put their faith in it, and they eat this meat sacrificed to the idol, and it is offending them. So Paul is asking the Christians, Corinthian Christians who know this, uh, that they should remember that there's others around them that are watching that may be stumbled by their liberties. And so be aware of this as loving Christian brothers. And he goes on in verse 8, But food does not condemn, commend us to God, for neither if 
we eat, are we the better or nor if we do not eat, are we the worse? He's still speaking to now these believers who have this knowledge. They understand that an idol is nothing. So it continues that thought with these mature believers who don't understand what they're doing to the weaker believers. He said the food will not commend your relationship because they felt like maybe they were a little holier because I could actually eat of this meat and it doesn't bother me because I know that idol is nothing. And so God must be at liberty with me and gracious because I have that liberty. You remember Peter, right? When God told him as he bring the sheep down, hey, eat of the unclean food now. And so maybe they were looking at that teaching and thinking, wow, we can eat of that. God must be pleased because we're being obedient in eating the food that's unclean. Could be that, but I don't know. I'm just surmising at this point. But whatever it was, they felt that they were better. And if they didn't do it, they felt somehow that they were worse and they weren't enjoying the liberties of God. And Paul's saying very clearly this, this uh, commend here is progressive and particular and punctual. So it's happening in their hearts every time they're eating the meat, and it's actually occurring among the church. And he goes on to say, it's not going to commend us to God. We are neither the worse continually. In other words, we're not going to be left behind in the race that God has us in, nor are we going to fail or reach the goal or fall short, Paul is saying. Continually, you will not be worse. And if we do not eat, nor the better. Again, the better means to exceed or to fix a number of measure, like if you, you somehow achieve something, Paul is saying here. He says, if we do eat, and again, that's punctual, and it's likely to happen there in the church, you're not going to get better, and you're not going to get worse. In other words, your relationship and union with Christ is set already. It's set. You know, if you were to never do anything from this point on, you're still going to heaven because you put your faith in Jesus Christ. It's set. It's done. You can't build upon it. You can't get better. You can better your relationship with him by spending more time with him and building upon that. But your union is already set all by the work of Jesus Christ alone. Isn't that good news? Yeah, that is good news because it's not based upon you or your work. It's all his work. And there's a peace in that. There's a peace in that. And I know some of us don't have that peace because we're basing it on our works. Well, how can you love me? I'm not doing the right thing. I might be living in sin. I'm not still there yet. Don't worry. God will get you there. He'll get you there one way or another. If it's by pulling your ear. You know, my mom, when, when I get in trouble, she get over here. I'm like, okay, mom, okay, mom. Okay, mom. And that got my attention, right? And God sometimes has to, like, pull your ear a little bit, you know? I'm going to get the chunky line. Okay, mom, I'm right there. Yeah. Or it's by his love. You're getting away with it, and you think, wow, he's not doing anything. Yeah, he's loving you right now. You're going, no, oh, stop it, Lord. Don't love me like that. You know I'm not right right now. But he just keeps loving you. I know you're not right, but I love you. I want you to know I love you. I want you to feel I love you. I want you to understand I love you no matter what I love you. Right? Romans 8, 31 <clears throat> on. There's no height, no death, no, no power, no principality can ever separate you from the love of God. Yes. Nothing. Thank ever. God. That's how much I love you. So he'll pull you, or he will just love you to death. And you know what I have found? His loving hurts more than his pulling of my ear. Because, man, that's so convicting. And it just gets to my conscience when he loves me, uh, even though I'm sinning. Even while we were yet still sinners, he died for us. He goes on, but bewarely somehow this liberty of yours becomes a stumbling block to those who are weak. So again, he's still speaking to the mature believers. And he's saying, take care, take care which is emphasized here continually. That's what he's really emphasizing here more than anything else in this verse. In the Greek, what he's saying is, take care. And he like pauses so you hear that clearly. So in other words, he's saying, consider, contemplate, look at, to weigh out the consequences, carefully examining what you are doing as a mature Christian, that this liberty... And liberty means the power of choice to do as you please. And that's in the active voice. So that is what you are doing, right? Active voice means your action, how you're doing that thing, right? Middle voice is you're helping or someone is helping you with a thing. Passive voice is God doing the thing through you. So this is you and your choice taking these liberties. 
of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block. In the Greek, that's one word, stumbling block. It means an obstacle in the way of which if one is striked, his foot against, he stumbles and falls. That's what it is. If you do something with your liberty and someone sees you who says, wow, this meat that's offered to this idol and I've experienced this somehow, I was blessed because when I used to do idol worshiping and now that I'm a believer, somehow it helped me and so I kind of still hang on to it. It's like Christians today who still hang on to the rosary, you know, or a certain prayer, you know, something like that. <clears throat> and all of a sudden they see a mature Christian brother eating the meat from that idol and they're going, wow, so it must be true. I'm going to get back into that. And now it's like you put in a log and all of a sudden they trip and they fall and they stumble because of what you've done. Now that's sin and he's going to say that here in a moment. He says in, in 10 through 12, you sinned against Christ. Now I don't want you to feel condemned and I'm going to share with you why and what this word sin means. But we're all sinners and fall short of the glory of God. <clears throat> Every one of us our, Isaiah says our righteousness are like filthy rags. And that filthy rags is talking about a woman's menstrual pad. That's bad. That's our righteousness. That's how bad we are. That's our, our, our heart. And the Bible says our hearts are wicked, deceitful. Who can even know? I don't even know my own heart. Only God knows it. And so if we're sinners already, adding sin to it doesn't make us the worst. It just reveals what we are. And so we need to confess that. But I'll, I'll build on that. I just needed to say that because I don't want you to feel condemned. Because Romans 8 right, tells us there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. So even when we sin, we're not condemned because Christ's blood, when he said, Tostalistai, it is finished, past, present, future Amen. sins, God's covered. Yeah. Doesn't mean that we willfully sin then, mm -hmm. but we work on those areas of our life. So he goes on in verse 10, if... For if anyone sees you who has knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will not the conscience of him who is weak be emboldened to eat those things offered to idols? So he speaks to the weaker brother who might follow your example and be sinning. So if someone sees you, again, that's particular, because you don't eat every second of the day, but when you do eat, at that breakfast or that lunch or that dinner time, and it's likely to occur because you're purchasing this meat. So when that happens, that action, you, the one who has this knowledge, this understanding of what idols really are, and you're dining in the temple. I wonder what that looked like, dining in the temple. I'm sure it's different than our Chinese restaurant when Buddha's sitting there. But <laughs> in the temple there, I'm sure that there were temple prostitutes around, there were tables out, they were walking around among you, there were probably idols all over the place, people offering meats and, and monies, and it was just idolatry. And a weaker brother comes along and they see you and they're like, wow, what's so-and-so doing in the bar there? Because he has the liberty to drink and not get drunk, but he's exercising that. What is he doing in that bar? You know what a bar looks like, right? I've all, we've all been in, well, maybe not. I've been in bars. You walk in, and first thing you smell is smoke. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then it's dark. And then you see a counter with guys all lined up, and usually one woman or two, who go to the local bar, women, put it kindly, pool tables, <laughs> machines, so you can play your games and so forth. I, I know what they look like. And you're walking in then, and someone outside says, wasn't that pastor going in that bar? <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't that him? Right? Now I got some explaining to do. You know? So the next bar comes along, you're like, I'm going to go in the bar now too. Pastor went in, so let me go in. And by the way, I don't go into bars. Just to make that clear, cut and paste, and the pastor goes in the bars. So that's what he's saying. This, this temple, you're sitting there. And, and, and so their conscience, again, that intercourse, that intimacy that they had with idols, all of a sudden is like, wow, I can have that? I have the liberty to have that again? They're weak. They're feeble-minded. And he says, you're going to strengthen that. You're going to restore that. The word strengthen means like restore a building back to its original state. Wow. God's been tearing that down, and all of a sudden you come along and you build it back up. That's how horrific it is. 
And yet you're eating these things sacrificed to, to idols. And he goes on and says in verse 11, And because of your knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. I mean, that's pretty clear what Paul is saying here. That knowledge, that moral wisdom that you have liberty to continue to live. That weaker brother who is feeble. And he adds to the word. It's a different word than the first week. This one has to be without strength. <clears throat> Not just feeble, <clears throat> but literally without strength. Because you could be feeble. Like I'm feeble right now. I have an injury and I'm feeble. If, if you came up to me and challenged me in an arm wrestling deal, I'd probably fall over. Because I'm feeble. But add to that without strength, that means I couldn't even get up to arm wrestle you. And that's what he's saying here. He, he's amplifying that weakness within that brother. It's, he, in other words, he's powerless to it. Now some of us might understand that. Uh, we might have sin in our life where we seem to be powerless to it. We can't fight it. for some. We just keep falling into it. It's like, where, Lord, I have no power to fight it. I just keep doing it, Lord. And that's where you get on your knees and you pray and you seek God for the yeah, Holy yeah. Spirit and for the power of God that he's already given to us. And by faith, we need to exercise that power. Yes. That power I liken sometimes, though it's not accurate enough, to the second wind that we sometimes get. When I was in high school, I loved running. I used to run at Mount Sac in their, their three-mile course. And usually about two miles into the, the course, I'm just beat. You know, I'm just like, okay, how am I going to make this? And then you see the finish line, and for some reason you go, it's there. And all of a sudden you just feel like this energy just starts to build up. And you got your second win, and you just start hitting it because you know it's almost over, and you're just going to give it all your all to cross that line. And I remember being in a race one time, and a couple of guys that were watching me in this race, it was invitational, and, and you get medals if you're the top five. And this guy told me, you're number six. Catch the guy, and you got a medal. Man, did that give me win? Mm. Like, yes, you mean I get, oh, I'm like, oh, I'm running as fast as I can. And I see him coming, and I see all five of them now, because I'm that close. And I'm like, yeah, all I need is one, all I need is one. And I just ran as fast, and I passed that one, and then I pooped out. <laughs> but I thought to myself, I got a medal. I got a medal. I mean, I was excited, but I did have a lot of energy that I could have kept going and got fourth place and then third place possibly. Not first or second, but maybe third, which would have been an accomplishment for me. The only problem was we're in high school and people don't like math. And so those guys were wrong. I was seventh. And I needed to catch two guys, which I could have done. But see, I followed their knowledge and I just was satisfied with the one when I shouldn't have been and I should have gave it my all. And that's what happens to us <coughs> when we are powerless. We really need to see God for that power, but don't limit it. Take it all. Lord, give me that power to totally have victory over this. I, I can't do this myself. I really can't. This has got to be in that passive voice, Lord. You've got to help me through this because I can't do it. Amen. And, and when you try and you fail, don't quit. Don't be a quitter. Get back up and keep at it again. Don't ever quit. I don't care how many times you've fallen. God understands. We're feeble. We're powerless. But God loves us unconditionally. And we will succeed if we continue on. So he says if you're going to do this, you're going to make this weaker brother uh, who is in ruin. And that word ruin literally means destroy him. In other words, give him over to eternal misery and hell to perish to be lost or destroyed. So literally, you may be a part of him rejecting Jesus Christ and going back to his old life, like a dog to his own vomit. That's what Peter describes it as. And you say, well, I don't want to be that guy. Because this is the guy that Christ died for. And so Paul tells us very clearly in verse 12, but when you thus sin against the brethren, and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. So Paul is serious here to the believers at that point because he wants us to understand how much God wants us to love one another. It's about loving one another. Not the, not the cultural love, right? Where we love one another despite of whatever we do. That's not the love he's talking about. Because he's talking about the love that spares a soul from hell. That's the kind of love. It's a biblical love. That you care enough to tell somebody the way that you're living is sending you to hell. And I love you enough to say, don't continue on that path. 
because it's broad and a lot of people are going down that path. You either follow the narrow path, the path that Jesus set, that will lead you to eternal life. You have to love each other that much. And if it means that you not eat meat, then don't eat meat if you're going to stumble your brother. Or as I said to you before, be wise. Drink your, your, your apple cider in your house and enjoy it and then wrap it up in a double bag and tie it down real nice and throw it in the trash can and you know, no one sees it. Now, I'm not saying sin in your house and then don't let anyone know. I'm not talking about sinning. I'm talking about your liberty, the things that we have liberty to do. So understand that. So what Paul is saying here, and he makes it very clear, that when you sin against your brother, you sin against Christ. Now, I want to build this up. I'm not going to give you my Amplified, but I want, to, I want you to see this because I think you need to see this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12, it says, For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body. So also is Christ. So Paul likens the church as a body, a physical body. And the head of that church is who? Christ. So if Christ is the head and we're the body and we sin against the part of the body, who are we sinning really against? The head. If I hurt you on your arm, your head's going to let you know that you hurt it. It's going to feel it. Right? So it makes sense. That if we sin against one another, we're sinning against Christ, who is the head of the body of Christ. And Paul is making that clear. So when we are responsible for a believer's falling away from Christ, we are affecting Christ himself. And that's sad, that a child of God would disregard Christ's heart for all humanity. Because Christ loves everyone. And we should love everyone just the same. Now, a Christian will really love somebody. If you call yourself a Christian and you're a believer in Christ and you're serving in the Lord, your heart should be changed enough where if you sin against someone, it affects you. You'll feel it. Not in the sense as the world says, oh, I just hurt someone and they're going to think bad of me. I don't care about that. That doesn't mean that it's, that it's affected you enough. When you hurt somebody, you hurt. You go, I can't believe I did that, Lord. I sinned against you. Man, would you help me not to do that in any circumstance? I shouldn't be doing that. This is your very heart, and it should be my heart. So right now, my heart isn't functioning the way it should. I got a murmur there, and I need to correct that murmur. And so Lord, would you take that from me, somehow remove it from my heart so that I don't affect you nor my brothers in Christ Jesus? That's the heart of a Christian. And Paul is trying to bring that out in the Corinthians. Don't be so callous that your liberties are more important because I have a right, and we hear that, I have a right, I have a right to do this, and I have a right to do that. But if your rights offend someone else, it's sin to you, and you're sinning against the Lord. So Paul, third point, we'll end here, therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never again eat meat, at least I make my brother stumble. Now the word never there in the Greek is no, not. It's indirect questions expecting an affirmative answer. And there's two Greeks that he uses here, which is interesting. So it's no not to what is being asked here, that Paul says, no, not ever will I eat meat again. And then he even says, no, not even the least will I eat meat. So the, Paul's conviction was great here. And he loved his brethren so much. So when you read the, the epistles of Paul, and he talks about the love that he has for them, I mean, that was deep, intimate love that he really had for them. It wasn't superficial at all. He loved them, and he loved that they were walking with the Lord, and that he was fulfilling the calling that God called him to be an apostle of Jesus Christ, a teacher to those believers, equipping Ephesians 6, equipping the saints for the work of the ministry. And that's what a pastor does. And Paul was willing to sacrifice his own very life, because if he ate, it would stumble a brother. So he said, I'd rather not cause my brother to stumble. Some lessons here, and we'll close with this. Love sets aside its privileges. True love sets aside its privileges. Even when it's silly, it's a silly thing to do. And you think, what's a big deal? But yet he's offended. I shared with you about the brother that didn't like me using the dirt devil vacuum cleaner. <laughs> right? I don't think, in my head, I was thinking, the vacuum cleaner. <laughs> yeah, so it's a dirt devil. But he was truly offended, didn't like it. 
And so I got rid of it. It might be silly, but true love sets aside the privileges that we have. True love is concerned about how it affects or actions will influence others. And love is willing to sacrifice its own rights for the sake of others. Now, there's no greater picture than the picture of Jesus Christ himself. He sacrificed everything for others. And that is the picture that we should have in our hearts. If Christ died for others and sacrificed for others, then so should we. And guys, ladies, it should start with you in your marriage. Sacrifice to yourselves for your spouse and then for your children and teaching your children how to sacrifice for one another. Literally taking the time purposely to teach them what it means to be like Christ and sacrifice to others. And when you do that as a family unit, it will trickle over into the community. It really will because you'll create a good characteristic within your children. And that's what God wants. He wants us to shine as lights in this community. Uh, that his, his glory would be glorified in all things. Amen? Amen. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. And maybe some of you have realized that your walk with Jesus hasn't been perfect. Maybe you've been a little bit uncommitted, and maybe now is the right time to just recommit your life to the Lord. So I want to just pray a prayer. And if you just agree with me, then we'll agree together, and God will be faithful. Father in heaven... There are areas in my life, Lord, that I sometimes take liberties, Lord, without thinking. And I've sinned against you, Father, as the scriptures have said. And I know that I've done it against a brother. He might have deserved it, Lord, but I've sinned against you, Father. And I ask that you forgive me. And that you help me to be sensitive in that area, Father. Wash me and cleanse me, Lord. And fill me with your Holy Spirit afresh and anew, Lord. And help me, Lord, to apply the scriptures that were shared today, Father. The truth that was shared today, Father. And if you don't know Jesus Christ, then simply believe that God resurrected him from the dead. And if you believe that he resurrected and he's alive today in heaven, you'll be saved. Believe that it was his righteousness and his work that saves us all. And surrender your life to him. By praying, Lord Jesus, come into my life. I'm a sinner, and I have fallen short. Give me eternal life through the work of your Son alone. There's nothing I can add to it, Lord. So I receive it in Jesus' name. Fill me with the Holy Spirit that I may walk with you afresh and anew, Lord. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand. God bless you. Have a wonderful, blessed day. Amen.